Hi, good afternoon. I'm Paulo Sotero, director of the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center. You're very welcome here for this session uh, on the aftermath of President Bolsonaro's visit to Washington and prospect for uh, economic reform in Brazil. We will have two panels this afternoon, and, uh, and the first one will be moderated by our uh, program, senior program assistant, Anja Prusa, uh, and I will let her, uh, Dania, introduce uh, our speakers from the International Monetary Fund. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. As Paula said, I'm Anya Prusa. I'm an associate here at the Brazil Institute. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here today for this timely discussion. Um, although I suppose I probably should also be thanking President Jair Bolsonaro and Donald Trump, since their much anticipated meeting yesterday has raised expectations for US-Brazil relations. And I'm sure that's at least part of why you're all here today. One of the big questions for our panelists is whether those expectations are justified. We know that President Trump and President Bolsonaro are perhaps unusually aligned in terms of their political styles and positions, and they seemed to get along well together yesterday at the meeting. But many of the proposed areas for cooperation, the new energy forum, the renewal of the CEO forum, US support for Brazil's admission to the OECD, all of these depend on Brazil's capacity to address its domestic challenges. Without meaningful pension reform and other structural adjustments, foreign investment, whether from the United States or elsewhere, is unlikely to flood into the Brazilian economy, and that economy is likely to remain weakly growing. These are just some of the issues we are going to discuss during our two panels, starting with Brazil's economic prospects. It is my pleasure to introduce for our first panel Antonio Spilimbergo, Assistant Director of the Western Hemisphere Department at the International Monetary Fund and IMF Mission Chief for Brazil, and Krishna Srinivasan, Deputy Director of the Western Hemisphere Department at the IMF. They are co-editors of a recent book <coughs> published by the IMF titled Brazil, Boom and Bust, The Road to Recovery, and have closely followed the twists and turns of Brazil's economic difficulties in recent years. You can find their full bios in the event handouts, and they've also brought flyers, which you can grab by our door, with information on how to buy the book. After the presentation, we're going to have a short Q&A and then move directly into our second panel. For those of you watching online with our live webcast, you can tweet at BrazilInst with your questions and join the conversation. Antonio Krishna, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Anna, and to the Wilson Center for hosting us this afternoon. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context for this book, this book brings together work we've been doing as a team over the last two to three years. It includes contributions from a staff of the IMF, the World Bank, and leading policymakers in Brazil. In today's presentation, we'll pick a few key themes from the book and talk about prospects going forward for Brazil. So if you want the whole book, uh, you can get it at the IMF website and also available over the internet uh, free of charge. Right, Linda? So with that, let me uh, hand it over to Antonio. We'll split the presentation in two halves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hosting this event. This is the first book presentation in Washington, and we are very honored to be here at the Wilson Center, which traditionally has been a very nice house for us. Uh, uh, two words about the book, and uh, I will start uh, with the presentation. This is uh, is a book, it's a chapter book. We have uh, uh, authors from IMF and authors from the Brazil, from, from Brazil, and uh, this is a legacy, a testimony of the good collaboration IMF had with the with the with the Brazilian authorities over time. If you look at the summary at the chapters, uh, however, there. Are two things that are peculiar. Uh, uh, how to say, we have a, a lot about uh, growth, a lot about, uh, about social issues, about uh, fiscal issues, monetary issue, change rate. But one big uh, part is missing, and it's not the case. And it's a case about the BOP, balance of payment. In the past uh, 10 years ago, 
there was a big debate about all the external constraint. Now it's much less. It's a sign of the times that the book about the macroeconomic situation in Brazil doesn't have, doesn't focus on the current account. And I think it's, this is very important. It's a key step that is changed. If we had to write this book 10 years ago, that would be a central topic. Now it's not there. But there is another section which is here and probably was not there 10 years ago, would not have been there 10 years ago. We have three chapters about uh, governance, corruption, and issues like this. And this is also a sign of the change. So somewhat uh, there is a, a, a movement away from the traditional external constraint, which was a conundrum of the problem of Brazil for, many, for decades, and something new, which is new for the fund, but in the last few years we have been very focused on this, recognizing the economic and macroeconomic uh, implication of governance. It's a delicate topic, but it's a fundamental topic, and we thought that it was important to put. As you recognize by, from my accent, I'm Italian, and I used to say that uh, Italy and Brazil have three things in common. One is very bad growth performance, and I will speak a lot about this. And uh, second is a fiscal problem, a large and increasing fiscal debt, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about this. And third is the political inability to uh, to deal with these issues. And uh, we'll, uh, the panel after hours will talk a, a lot about this. So with this in mind, uh, given the big picture and my background as an Italian, I, uh, I go to the book. Um, the book. Oh. Okay. First thing, uh, that it, it, I think it's important to give a little bit of historical perspective. In this presentation, Chris and myself will not go over the 24 chapters of the book. That would be impossible in a few, uh, in few minutes. But we just give some glimpse of the main topic and uh, indication where, how they are dealt in the book. First important thing, Brazil growth has been bad, both in respe with respect to other emerging markets and with respect with its recent past. Brazilian growth was very high before uh, 1980, basically, and since the uh, recession 81, as uh, growth has averaged 2.6%, which is low for uh, an emerging market at that stage of development. And uh, what is surprising is that people in the 80s were always talking about the last, lost decade. Well, it's lost, but it's not that the 90s were a big change. And this disappointing growth was, has been there for 40 years. So we, it's not just a business cycle issue, it's more a structural issue. And a lot of chapters, and as my colleague Krishna will go into more detail, uh, deal exactly why we have this structural problem growth which is unable to go beyond 2.6%. Uh, we compare with other major economies in Latin America, and you can see Brazil uh, was very high in the past, but uh, in the last three decades has been quite low. So, um, as, as I mentioned, the growth in, growth in 80s was considered disappointing, and in the 90s you see a, a bunch of reform, which were very important, the new currency, a floating exchange rate, inflation target, the fiscal responsibility, many financial reforms, some privatization of state-owned national enterprise, and an important trade liberalization, not complete, but important. What is interesting is that despite all these reforms, Brazil didn't take off as, as much as we wanted. Uh, this graph is quite indicative. Here you see Brazil, uh, starting in the 80, compared with other major market, ma major major markets, as you can see, Brazil uh, was the most disappointing over the long term. So, uh, um, not only in um, Latin America, but also across the world. One silver line in this is that, despite the disappointing growth, 2.6 is. Re for an emerging market is abundant. Brazil did very well in the, Gini in the reduction of poverty. And here the interesting information is that it's not just the last two decades before the global financial crisis, but even before Brazil was doing well in reducing poverty, possibly because it was 
um, starting from a very bad position, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not just a reduction which happened during the two administrations ago. And um, while, for instance, look, in the 90s, Brazil reduced poverty, while the rest of Latin America was increasing poverty uh, in many respects. Um, now, why growth has been <coughs> so, so low? Well, the main reason is that uh, um, productivity has been quite low, very low. And uh, if you look at uh, all growth was due mostly to capital accumulation and labor accumulation, uh, labor and education. Actually, TFP grew by about 1% per year, uh, total factor of productivity, which is not uh, a, a big achievement. So really, we have to focus why growth has been so low. Given that the Brazil has already benefited from the <coughs> demographic dividend in the last decades, now we have to move uh, uh, to the idea why this is not, uh, uh, why uh, uh, TFP has been so lagging. Um, we identify five uh, big issues, uh, and I will just speak about the first one, and uh, my colleague Krishna will talk about the rest. Why productivity has been low, and what can be done to increase productivity. Uh, first, uh, uh, first, actually, which is not just productivity, it's broadly macroeconomic consistency, is an unsustainable fiscal situation, position. This is important, because if the fiscal situation is not good, uh, the only way to place your debt is to have a big risk premium. Re uh, big risk premium means uh, long, large uh, interest rate in the medium term and hindering investment in the medium term. And one of the problems of Brazil has been low, slow investment. And so this is, is not a just a fiscal issue, as a big growth implication. Um, going to uh, fiscal sustainability. Well, uh, fiscal was not uh, good to begin with, but it became really bad during the global financial, uh, during the recent crisis in 2015-16. Here we have two lines, one showing the primary balance, which is a flow measure, and the other is the non-financial public debt, which is a stock measure. As you can see, the green light, and you can write on the line, went uh, quite quickly from about 60%, which is above the average for emerging market, but not so much, to a really high level of 87%. Now, for Brazilian observers, we know, they know that we are using a different definition of debt, but even if you use other definition of debt, you see the same dynamic. So, uh, and you have a trajectory, I'm talking about the green line here, which is clearly unsustainable if something is not done quickly. And uh, on the right hand side, uh, we see a chart showing Brazil with a thick line compared to other emerging markets. And there we make the same point, that we respect to other, two things are in the right hand side. First, that Brazil is higher than the rest of EMs. Second, not only is higher, it's becoming higher and higher over time. So something has to be done very quickly to avoid an unsustainable situation. Uh, so let's, let's go into focus what can be done. One can, and uh, before doing this, uh, which is, um, and we elaborate a lot on the book, in the book, uh, let's focus on one, some of the challenges. The challenges, one of the big challenges is the structure of the Brazilian uh, public expenditure. Uh, a lot here what we do is to show how different countries, Brazil, Colombia, and so on, how much of the expenditure is, uh, um, is earmarked in a way or another. So it's a matter to show how much of flexibility you have in your budget. Brazilian, in Brazil, flexibility is very little. Almost 100% of public expenditure the green light is a bar showing different sector, is earmark or another way or another. This is a legacy of the 88 constitution. Uh, I remind Brazil was exiting a difficult period. The new constitution wanted to avoid some 
error of the past. So what it has a, it's a heavy, what we call a heavy constitution with a lot of prescription. But the result is that a lot of expenditure is really uh, uh, pu um, th th there was a lot of hand tying, so to speak, with respect to other countries. Uh, compared to Chile, there is much less uh, expenditures, which is uh, which is earmarked. Um, Mexico and Br Brazil is much higher. This makes fiscal adjustment much more difficult because it's not just a political problem; it's also a legal constitutional issue, and for which you need a, a, a majority which is higher than the usual uh, majority. So this is a, uh, we have to be mindful when, as economists, we preach fiscal consolidation because this implies a constitutional change. So it's not just a, a political will. <laughs> Second characteristic that I would like to, to, to focus attention is that um, two big items in Brazil, uh, pension and public sector wage, which are out of, um, how to say, uh, not in equilibrium for other, uh, compared to other countries, much higher. On this, we have the share of population age 65 and older, and he, on the vertical axis, is the expenditure on pension uh, as a share of GDP. As you expect uh, that people who are older population spend more on, um, on pensions. But what is striking here is that Brazil spends much more than its demographic would, uh, would, um, would imply. So it's, mm, it spends as much as a share of GDP as Germany, but uh, with a population structure which is much younger. And this is a problem. And compound with the fact that a lot of this is, is as I motivated before, linked with the Constitution and with this year market, this makes the issue com very complicated. The other is, a comp uh, is a compensation of public employees. And um, without going into, the, into details, uh, uh, dark and uh, light green, you see, Brazil expenditure for employee, which is 13% of GDP, which is higher than not only Latin America, much higher than Latin America, but much higher than other emerging markets, and higher than the advanced economy. And so, so that is also a big issue. So you have two big items in the budget, which are very high and out of proportion with respect to other countries. We have two metrics, one comparing with the, as a share of GDP and the other as a share of government expenditure. So, but in both dimensions, Brazil is peculiar. And the book deals a lot, it has nice um, chapter, and actually showing how, uh, with very nice data, and the book has a lot of graphs, actually, and I like this because you see visually how Brazil is doing is different from other countries and uh, in, in a way which is, and actually this expenditure has also bad implication for income distribution. Um, so well, uh, now let me go a little bit on the future. Um, as you know, Brazil adopted in December 2016 an um, expenditure cap. The expenditure cap uh, says basically you have to keep a real expenditure constant for the future. And uh, so what we did here is, uh, actually what we did, what this gentleman here, uh, our co-author did, <laughs> uh, Mauricio Soto, and uh, um, um, we <laughs> basically took this, uh, um, uh, we divide the expenditure in education, in, uh, sorry, in uh, pensions, payroll, and other. And as you go, 8.5% is on pension, the personnel and the rest. And uh, we say this, with this composition of expenditure complies with the constitutional uh, day two. Now, if we had to project without any reform, what would happen in 2023? Simply using the current rules, we are well above the tattoo. Now, assuming pension reforms quite ambitious, we are able to respect the tattoo. 
But the important, the key message, and I think this is very important and it has not been appreciated enough, that not only you need to contain public pension, but on top you need to do a lot of other uh, fiscal measures. So pension reform is a necessary but not sufficient condition to respect the title. This, I think, it has not entered the political debate uh, in Brazil yet. Uh, and I think it's an important measure. So we are at the beginning of a fiscal consolidation, which implies pension reform. But this is just the first step, and it's not uh, uh, enough to keep, uh, uh, to respect the data, so to push Brazil to a, con a um, con how to say, convincing fiscal consolidation. Now, I, sp I talk about the two items for which Brazil is really out of proportion namely pension and uh, public, public wages. What is missing? What is not, uh, where Brazil is cutting? Unfortunately, Brazil has one of the lower public investment rate in the region. In that picture, we show wage bill as a share of GDP and uh, public investment as a share of GDP. As you can see, some countries like Bolivia, Ecuador, are doing a lot of public investment, 30%, and having a good wage bill. Brazil is doing the opposite. It has a, a very large wage bill, 13%, and very, very little investment. And this is a problem for the future. Just to have an idea, in the past, Brazil used to have an investment ratio of about 19, 20% of GDP which it was large, and it was, no, it was large, it was not so large, but uh, it was okay. Now it's about 16%, so it already was not doing so great, and now it's even less. And the public sector in particular, given the physical consolidation, will not be able to do more. So it's key to bring in, in some form or the other, the private sector. It's key to create the condition because the public sector cannot expand on the public investment. With this, I pass the... Ah, uh, yes. Uh, here we do list uh, a set of policies, and uh, again, which we elaborate more in the book on how fiscal consolidation can be, uh, can be achieved. As I said, one key message, which is sometimes forgotten, is that fiscal consolidation will need more than pension reform, and here we are just listing some of them. And I think that we have to open a debate on this. And I'm with this. Uh, this, uh, you click this one. Thank you. So uh, Antonio talked about the fact that growth has been coming down sharply in, in, in Brazil, and that it's a structural problem. One of the key elements he talked about was the fiscal, which is a big elephant in the room, which needs to be fixed. But beyond that, what are the impediments, structural impediments, which uh, mitigate growth prospects in Brazil? One of the key uh, deterrent for growth in Brazil is the quality of infrastructure. If you look at this chart on the left-hand side, it compares the quality of infrastructure in Brazil with its export rivals. This is an index where seven is the highest, one is the lowest. And what you see here is, if you look at Brazil, and the, the green ranges here represent the quality of, uh, of, the, of the infrastructure and exports rivals, the highest being the 75th percentile, the lowest of the 25th percentile, you can see that Brazil is even lower. It's at the lowest end of the quality of infrastructure here, and that hasn't changed over the years. So this is... When, when you talk about how can Brazil compete with export rivals in markets, you can clearly see that one of the biggest problems is infrastructure quality. And this is a country which, uh, which re relies a lot on road transportation. If you look at the right-hand side chart, it tells you that in the index for road quality, Brazil does very poorly. So one of the key issues here is that if Brazil has to become more competitive in the global market, if it has to boost its external uh, prospects, then infrastructure quality has to be improved. But again, this is linked to the fiscal situation. If you have to address this, you can do it either two ways. One is you have the government doing most of it, for which you don't have the resources, or you have the private sector do that. What you find here is uh, 
If you look at, this is a chart, which this is an issue which uh, Antonio had mentioned. If you look at investment in Brazil, it's pretty low. It's quite dismal compared to other countries in the region. And this chart just captures that uh, as a percent of GDP for the countries, the LA6 countries. And you, clear, you can clearly see that Brazil does worse than all other countries. Now, given the fact that fiscal constraints are daunting, the only way Brazil can do this, can address infrastructure gap, is to have greater partnership with the private sector. You see a little bit of that right now, but you don't see enough. So going forward, if Brazil has to grow at, at decent rates of growth, it has to have greater private sector involvement in addressing infrastructure gap, which we think is a key impediment to both productivity and growth prospects in Brazil. The second element which you talk about is the, the efficiency of the financial system. Now, Brazil is a very large country, but given that, what we see is that there's a huge amount of concentration in the banking sector. About 45% of banks are government-owned. The rest is private sector, but the foreign participation is quite low. It's 15%. Beyond the concentration, what does this concentration mean? You have that both in terms of the uh, number of banks there, also in terms of the products which banks give, whether it's mortgage lending, credit to uh, households, and so on. And a lot of the credit is earmarked. So what is available for the free enterprise is much lower. So not only do you have a banking system which is highly concentrated, it's also a banking system which is highly distorted because of the way credit is earmarked. So if you are an enterprise, if you're an investor trying to get access to credit, one, the amount available is low, and the rate at which you get it is very high. So the last slide there tells you the, 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 the interest rate costs you pay on, on credit, and you can see clearly the blue line is way out there. So access to credit is a big problem in a country the size of Brazil. Concentration, earmarking, distortions, three things. And if you look at investors and, how they, and what they tell you in terms of access to credit, Brazil has the highest number of in invest as a share of uh, total investors. Almost 50% of investors would tell you that access to credit is a key factor, which, uh, which is a big invest impediment for investment. And again, if you look at the right-hand side chart, you can see uh, on the x-axis you have credit to the private sector in terms of quantity, and you have the loans to deposit spread. And you can clearly see Brazil is an outlier. So if you want to have strong and durable growth prospects in Brazil, you have to reform the financial sector. And again, this is, as, 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 as Antonio was mentioning, it's, this goes beyond, well goes beyond what the focus is right now, which is on the fiscal. But the, the, the financial sector is something which needs repair, and I think that's something which needs to be focused on. Now, clearly, the previous administration did make some improvements in terms of reducing the subsidies on long-term credit uh, and insolvency framework, and more recently, you've had a, a credit registry. Now, these are important steps which have been taken, but more needs to be done in terms of reform of earmarked loans uh, program, refocusing public banks, uh, improving governance, uh, reducing high operating costs, credit enforcement has to be improved. Uh, and, and, so, and, and more generally, competition in the banking sector has to be strengthened quite significantly. So that's the second one. The first one is infrastructure. Second is the financial system. The third and the more important one also is on how open the economy is. If you look at the chart here on the, on the left-hand side, Brazil is one of the least open economies in the world. In fact, it ranks rock bottom there really rock bottom there. This is just a simple measure of exports and imports as a, service of GD, as a, as a share of GDP, and Brazil is clearly uh, uh, way down there. Now, where does it, where does it uh, show up? If you look at the right-hand side chart, it is a measure of trade restrictions, and we compare Brazil to the G20. The, G, the, green, the, the green, bar, green lines there, the G20 average, and the other one is G20 EM average. If you look at two aspects, where Brazil does particularly poorly, where it's close to zero, uh, the highest being one, is on taxation, import duties and taxation. Brazil does really badly. It has among the highest average tariffs in LA5 across the BRICS. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, high. And the second thing is they use a lot of non-tariff barriers, in particular anti-dumping duties and local content requirements. So in addition to the fact that you have high tariffs, uh, high average tariffs across 
uh, many sectors in the, in, the, in, in the economy. You also have a lot of non-tariff barriers, which are an added impediment to, uh, to, uh, to openness uh, and so on. So what, what does this mean? This means at a time when global trade was, bloom, was booming, Brazil missed out. It hardly participates in global value chains, and net result is it has not benefited from uh, global trade. And so going forward, uh, this has to be an issue which needs to be addressed. The previous government was getting to it in, at some level, and there's a chapter in the book which talks about the measures they were thinking of at least doing, uh, and it's, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a good chapter written by uh, policymakers there. Now, again, we all know that trade uh, is not everybody wins, that there are going to be clearly winners and losers when you open up the economy, and one has to recognize that. And um, so when you reduce trade uh, barriers, when you reduce ta tariffs and non-tariff barriers, some industries are going to close down and some are going to boom. What this chart, there's a chapter in the book which looks at which sectors, which industries, which regions will gain and, uh, and lose. And that's a good summary of the, of the map of Brazil there and, and which regions will be most affected adversely if you open up trade. Why so? Because they have the highest level of protection. So if you look at the protection levels across uh, regions of Brazil, some are clearly, some clearly stand out. So when you, when you talk about trade liberalization, you have to take care of people who are going to be adversely affected by opening up the economy. So when you talk about trade here, we're saying, yes, it'll be good for the economy, It'll be good to boost growth, to boost growth, but there'll be somebody who will be losing out in this process, some sectors, some regions, much more than the others, and you have to take care of them when you open up. But clearly, given the fact that this is one of the least open economies in the world, opening up trade will uh, give you significant growth dividends. And the last factor we talk about in the book is making the state more effective. Now, if you, if you look if you talk to investors uh, anywhere in the world, and including in Brazil, they'll tell you that it's not easy to do business in Brazil. This is, a, a, this is an ease of doing business uh, world, uh, compiled by the World Bank, and Brazil ranks 109 out of 190 odd countries. It ranks particularly poorly in some, some areas. For example, and I think Antonio mentioned that, if you look at the tax regime in, in Brazil, it's hugely complicated. It's not the friendliest of tax regimes. And that's where Brazil does particularly poorly. So when you talk about fiscal reforms, it's not just about getting your, uh, you know, getting targets made, but also you have to simplify the tax system, make it more investor friendly. And that's where uh, clearly investors point out. The second area we already talked about is access to credit, where again, Brazil does particularly poorly. And again, dealing with construction permits and so on. So across the board, making the state more effective and improving conditions for doing business is important. And there are some, there are some clearly some low-hanging fruits. When I say low-hanging fruits, I don't mean I, I'm using a bit uh, flippantly here. It, reforming a tax system is not easy. But you can clearly see that that has been identified as one of the key constraints. So if you were to target that, that can yield high uh, dividends down the road. So. So in terms of what are the serious reforms that you need, one is simplify and improve the transparency of the tax system, which I mentioned that's important. And secondly, you, you, when, you talk to, when you talk to bankers and others, and they'll tell you why the credit spreads are so high, they'll tell you that it's not easy to enforce contracts in Brazil. So that's why it's reflected in risk premium, which Antonio talked about. And so you have to have a judicial system which allows the enforcement of contracts. And again, there's been some work there, but not enough. Easing labor market regulations, now this is not easy in any emerging market, but that's clearly something which, which has been pointed out by investors. And again, promoting entrepreneurship, competition, innovation. Now the, this part is important. If you want to promote entrepreneurship, competition, innovation, you have to allow greater access to credits, you have to allow business to fail, and so on and so forth, and that, the framework you have right there is not favorable for, Brazil, uh, for, for, uh, for small firms in Brazil. And again, strengthening the legal framework of insolvency and fighting corruption and improving governance. On the last one, on co fighting corruption and, and governance, as Antonio mentioned, we have a number of chapters on that. If you look at corruption, if you look at Brazil uh, a, and look at any measure of corruption, corruption perception, Brazil doesn't do particularly badly compared to other countries in Latin America or even with other emerging markets. But once you take into account the level of development, the question is, Given the level of development, is corruption low or high? And you find that Brazil does particularly poorly. Uh, 
So Brazil, given its level of development, does quite poorly in terms of corruption perceptions. Now you might ask, are there any, any countries in Latin America which do particularly well? And the answer is, uh, two countries come out really well, Chile and Uruguay, where uh, if they, they are seen as countries where perception of corruption is lower. So from Latin America, if you take out these two countries, Latin America does particularly poorly. So the point here is, Brazil, in, 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 in Brazil, just not the news which we heard over the past few years. Even if you look at data, if you look at numbers, if you look at perceptions of corruption, it is very high, especially given its level of development. And again, that has been a clear, uh, it has clearly impacted policy uncertainty in Brazil over the last few years. It's affected investor sentiment uh, and so on. And they have made significant progress in trying to address that. In fact, that's very good. And one would hope uh, that going forward, that will yield uh, dividends in terms of growth uh, and productivity. Now, this is some work which we had done at the IMF, which looks at, you know, it's easy for people to say, you know, do structural reforms, you'll get bang for the buck, et cetera, et cetera. But structural reforms are not easy. Any reform which, uh, which you know, involves labor markets, a legal system is not easy to do. So what we do in this, in this analysis is we look at reforms which will have the highest impact on TFP growth, on productivity, right? We look at reforms which will have the highest uh, uh, TFP growth, and we, on, the, on the Y axis, we have reforms for which there's public support. And the belief here is, if there's an intersection between the two, then you go for those, uh, in, because one, they'll give you high productivity impact, and they're easy to do. So for example, if you look at banking sector reform, in terms of impact on productivity is very high, and there is public support for such reforms. So that, I would say, is something where you could do a lot using less, much less, relatively less political capital. On the other hand, if you look at labor market reform, impact on productivity is very high, you know, and you would expect that, and any, 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 any person who's worked in emerging markets will tell you that, but support for such reforms are, are very low. So there's a trade-off here between what you want to do. Some reforms clearly have high impact in TFP, but there's not public support for that. And there are others like banking sector where you have both impact on productivity and there's public support for reform. Now, again, if you, this is a partial equilibrium analysis. So you know you have to take things together. Trade openness, for instance, here shows up as low impact on productivity. But this public support, again, we shouldn't get misled by the fact that it, it, it may in isolation have impact on uh, low impact on productivity, but taken together with other reforms, it's likely to have a much bigger impact. So the point here is that there's a trade-off. Let's go for the for the ones where there is a lot of public support and, the, and, the, and it also has impact on TFP. So the question is, after doing, after hearing all this, what, what do we say? It's clear that Brazil has been in this equilibrium for too long, where it has low growth, which even in times of when you have had few years of rapid growth, clearly the economy goes back to its underwhelming trend, uh, its uninspiring trend. But there is way by which you can get back, get onto a trajectory of strong growth, durable growth, and inclusive growth. And how do you do that? And we talked about the five, six areas where work needs to be done. Uh, I won't say one is more important. Either. Clearly, the fiscal is very important, but other structural reforms are equally important to get this economy on a good trajectory. And you need clear um, priorities, political leadership. You have a new government in place. Uh, one would hope that you know that gives you the momentum to do things seriously. And you need partnership across all stakeholders. If without that, reforms are not likely to succeed. And so time is of the essence, and it's time to change gears and to move to a high, uh, high growth trajectory. But it can be done. It's been done in the past, and you can do it now. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna, Antonio, for your excellent presentation. I'm going to open the floor up to questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have microphones on either side of the room. Um, and just state your name and your affiliation. We have one here in the front. Uh, Peter Wogart, uh, former World Bank, now with the uh, German Institute of Global and Regional Studies. Uh, one macro, one micro question. <laughs> Let's start with the micro question first. Uh, and that depends what I did not hear, but probably it's in the book, uh, the importance of the public enterprises. And that includes particularly also the financial sector. You didn't mention it, but 
Brazil's development bank is infamous for misallocation of resources. You have a high interest country, difficult to get money there, and <coughs> the big guys get us, you know, the subsidies. The macro question is probably a little bit too much to ask. Uh, when we descended in the 60s to Brazil, uh, there was already a boom and bust. We had a superinflation in the early 60s. The military came in politically very hard, but economically, obviously, until the 80s, when you said this is the division point, it finally does, you know, was substituted by democracy. So the question now is for me, with this, you know, a democracy, with however a government which looks like this, you know, for more, I wouldn't say military, but at least uh, disciplinary effort, uh, are there then positive aspects to expect? <laughs> Thank you. Who would like to take a first stab at that? So on the issue of public enterprises and the BNDS, there is a chapter in the book which talks about that. Clearly, that's been an issue. And one of the things which the new government has done is to try to roll that back and make the market much more uh, laissez-faire in some sense in terms of credit availability. So I think those are reforms which you talk about in the book. We, we didn't talk about it much in the presentation, but clearly that's an issue. Uh, on the issue of uh, the new administration, uh, in terms of what they have talked about, in terms of priorities and so on, it is uh, we are cautiously optimistic that we can expect things to be done on the on the pension reforms and in terms of other fiscal reforms. They've talked about privatization. They've talked about opening up the economy and so on. So, I'd like to believe I'm cautiously optimistic that they will embark on some reforms which will be uh, which will hurt, uh, give it dividends over the long run. But uh, Antonio is the mission chief. He has a harder job to. So maybe he can <laughs> defend. No, no, I, um, yeah. The distortion of the pri of the public com public banks are are well known, and uh, we look forward to the new government, uh, which is has a strong agenda on them. Great. Do you have any other questions? Yes, one in the back. Hi, good afternoon, Alex Sanchez, Jane's Defense. Um, two questions. Kind of similar. What's your opinion about the the merger between Boeing and Embraer? It's not. Uh, it's worth four two point billion dollars. It's a, Embraer is like the crown jewel of the of Brazil's air, um, military in, in military and defense industry. What do you think about that? And um, I remember that last month, I believe, the infrastructure minister Freight has declared that he was that he planned to uh, either privatize or liquidate around a hundred state-run companies of, in Brazil. Is this a sort of um, initiatives that you think Bolsonaro should be pursuing to jumpstart the economy again? Thank you. Well, uh, IMF doesn't take a position on a specific uh, dec corporate decision, any particular industrial policy. We, in general, uh, are skeptical about uh, the ability of the government uh, to do industrial policy, and especially when it's driven by non-economic issue. But I don't want to comment. Uh, I don't know much about uh, that. Uh, it's not IMF purview. And yes, we have a question in the back, in the middle. Hello. Uh, my name is Paul Johnson. I'm a uh, consultant. Um, I was curious about your last comment, sir, about um, these reforms and the need to have them um, um, undergirding, strong, durable, and inclusive. Could you speak a little bit more about inclusivity with respect to um, selling these reforms to, to the public and the politics of that? And could you also speak to, um, with respect to the last 10 years, there was a lot of talk about uh, the rising consumer class and the economic and the social mobility of Brazil. Um, can you speak a little to that and if we're talking about uh, inclusivity, are we talking regional? Are we talking by class? Uh, are we talking by uh, sector of industry? Thank you. Yeah. Inclusivity, social mobility, and uh, um, um, good income distribution is a key issue, medium term, for which we do care. And uh, I um, 
And I think it's important to look at the single policies to understand uh, how they play. Um, one key issue which is highlighted in the book is that the present uh, system, pension system, and the public employment system, wage system actually worsen in many aspects, uh, is regressive, uh, has a bad effect on income distribution. This is something that has, has to be highlighted. Uh, so any reform should will uh, uh, of the pension system and public sector wage will if done judicially will go some way to reduce income inequality second uh, uh, there are other set uh, of reforms which may lead uh, to some issue for income distribution including trade uh, as krishna was pointing out we know that uh, from the literature that trade may have a big effect of income distribution. We are very mindful of that. Especially it has uh, some negative effect if there is no appropriate uh, um, labor setting and there is not enough flexibility so people who lose their job cannot find easily another job in that specific region. Brazil is a huge economy, it's like a continent. So we have to be mindful how people can find a job in the place where they lose them. And this is the reason why uh, we have a chapter there dealing with these issues. And we advocate strongly active labor market policy in conjunction with trade liberalization. You cannot do trade liberalization per se without thinking about the implication because could, you could have a bad social effect which would in the long term be a backlash. And I think this is very, is, is clear in our mind. So I gave three examples, pension, public sector wages, a trade, where actually pro-growth strategies will be also a pro uh, poor strategy, so to speak. I think one point which we made in, in our consultation with, with Brazil is this is a country which made significant progress in reducing inequality and poverty, and we want uh, we would like to them to build on that. So the idea here is if you have strong growth, you can also address some of these things and you can build on the success you've had in the past. So that's why I talked about the fact that you have strong, durable, and inclusive growth together. And some programs work very well to reduce poverty, as we know. Some programs which um, started already 20 years ago, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the challenges in Brazil is really getting sustainable growth, mm -hmm. right, that sustainably in the long term lifts people out of poverty. Uh, other questions? Yes, in the middle, also in the back. <laughs> I think we'll pass the mic down. I'm Asher Levine, uh, unemployed. <laughs> but I used to be a Reuters uh, correspondent in Sao Paulo during the Dilma years. Something that really struck me a lot when I was living there is that the, the best and brightest of that country um, are going for government jobs. You know, the concurso publico, be a judge, make a lot of money, retire early. What is the impact of that on the productivity of the country? Um, and I mean, if we're going to open up to trade, how are we going to get the right people incentivized to leave that, um, that draw that they have to public sector, sector jobs that are so well uh, remunerated? I can use an example from my own country. When I come from India in 91, um, I left the country in 88 when the economy was very closed. And when reforms happened and the economy opened up, you would see that there was it didn't take too long for people to move from uh, a, a desire to go only work for the government and to work for the private sector. So I think in some sense, there is a, it happens naturally when you open up the economy. And I think it will not be a problem in the case of Brazil. You will get the, bright and the, and the brightest to work for the private sector in the export sector. Right now, you, don't, you may not have the opportunity, so you don't know you go to the public sector. Once you open up the economy, there's a natural progression you'll see. And I've saw that, I saw that in my country. If my country had opened up in ni before I left the country, I wouldn't have come here. So you know, it, it happens. These things happen naturally. And so why should Brazil be an exception to that? up here in front. Hi, Gabrielle Mosley with the State Department. Um, just uh, picking up on what you discussed about reigning in mandatory public spending and particularly 
that this is not just a political problem, but a legal and constitutional issue that requires reform in all three areas. Um, are there currently reforms underway that would address these issues, or what, what do you think the likelihood in the near term or the next decade would be to address these issues? I think these issues have been recognized for a while, and the, the current government, uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Gedesh, has uh, put this on the table for discussion a few weeks ago, and uh, uh, there will be, uh, as you stress, and as I said before, there is a need of consensus on this, uh, if anything, because you need uh, a constitutional reform. So I think that uh, is something that uh, policymakers have this well in mind, uh, and the issue is now to find uh, the political consensus for this. Uh, and I'm less, uh, uh, how to say, I know less about the political system. I think the following panel will can, dis can discuss more on this. Mm -hmm. Great. It's a nice transition, actually. It is. <laughs> I actually have one question, privilege of the moderator. <coughs> you had mentioned, Krishna, that banking sector reform might be one of these low-hanging fruits, right, where there's um, high growth potential and actually public support for this type of reform. What else do you think the government should tackle? You know, what are some things that maybe don't require a constitutional amendment that could actually produce growth that the executive could just do? I think opening up trade is something where I don't, you don't need, you don't have the constraint. And even though the chart which I showed uh, indicated that opening up trade doesn't have big TFP impact. Uh, like I said, this is a partial equilibrium analysis. If you were to take trade liberalization along with, say, financial sector reform, uh, I think that has potential for huge uh, uh, impact on productivity and growth, and also more acceptable. Right? And so, but the question, the point again, which Antonio made, when you open up trade, there are regions in the country which will be adversely affected. So you have to think in terms of trade reform along with you know, labor market reform, which, go, which helps people who are displaced. And along with financial sector reform, I think you can get a bang for your buck in terms of high TFP growth and public acceptance. Thank you. Antonio, I don't know if you have anything you would like to see the government do. No, I'm very excited about to see the, the reforms that the new government has put forward. And mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think with that, we're going to transition to our second panel. We're going to take about two minutes just to change everything out so you can grab coffee, use the restroom. Um, and I would also like to thank, while I have you all here, our staff, Lara Pekansov, who organized this event for us, and our fabulous interns who are around the room. Thank you very much, guys. Stay for the next... You're, you're staying, right? Thank you. Uh, just as we transition, I'd like to compliment one information on Embraer and Boeing. It's interesting. This is probably the most consequential agreement ever between Brazil and the United States. Not ever, but since in the past few decades. This involved two private companies. Minimum government involvement in the negotiations that took about 18 months. Uh, the main contribution of the Brazilian government, obviously the Air Force, the Brazilian Air Force, which is the birthplace of Embraer, uh, thanks to a collaboration that started in 1953 between Embraer, uh, between the Brazilian Air Force and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that led to the creation of one of the best engineering schools in Latin America, the Institute, uh, Technological Institute of the Air Force. Uh, the officers of the Air Force were enthusiastic about this, this operation. Uh, and the main contribution of the Brazilian government was to stay away and not use its power the uh, Brazilian government has a golden share of 30%, uh, could have used that to veto the deal and decided not to. So this tells you something, may tell you something about what works, what doesn't work moving forward. And uh, I wanted to invite now our dear friends that will help uh, discuss the uh, to be in the next panel, is an assessment of President Bolsonaro's visit to Washington and how the political environment 
uh, you know, uh, back home will affect this cooperation. Always keep in mind what you just heard, because the outcome of this challenge, of uh, the economic challenge, of putting the Brazilian economic house in a better order, uh, uh, will be probably the essential element uh, that will dictate, I would be a little bit daring here, the success or failure of the visit long term. Either Brazil face those challenges, uh, regardless of what happens politically there or here, or we are going to continue to be dealing with the same problem. Uh, with that, I would like to call to the uh, stage four dear friends uh, and experts on all things dealing with Brazil. Roberto Simon, he is a senior director of policy at the Council of the Americas in New York. Nicholas Zimmerman, he is a consultant, macro advisory partners. Uh, Tiago Aragon, he is a partner and director of intelligence at Arco Advice, a consulting firm based in Brasilia. Mauricio Moura, founder and CEO of IDEA Big Data. Uh, we, they are all very well known to us. Their bios are in the flyer here. And uh, guys, please come to stage. Time to work. <laughs> so I would like to start. I would start, like to start by just to summarize uh, the President Bolsonaro's first visit, uh, first official visit uh, as president abroad was here. Normally, it used to be in the past, it used to be to Argentina. President Bolsonaro decided to make a statement by coming here first. Uh, it was... Uh, a successful visit. I think uh, the objectives that were announced beforehand were accomplished, I think, on both sides. Uh, it created an opportunity for Brazil and the United States to deepen a bilateral dialogue, bilateral dialogue that has been historically good, shallow, and inconsequential. Now you have the opportunity to relaunch this uh, I have been in Washington for almost 40 years as a journalist. I covered many of those state vi these visits. Uh, actually, the image of uh, the Rose Garden yesterday uh, remind me of uh, the last such a scene in the Rose Garden. It happens in April of 1995 <coughs> when <coughs> President Bill Clinton greeted President Fernando Henrique Cardoso, Washington. That was an official visit. This was a working visit. Those visits tend to, uh, you can sort of see what's going to happen before it starts. And I actually wrote a piece uh, that was published Saturday in the Financial Times that basically describes the, the outcome, what was possible to accomplish. It is important, what was accomplished was important. Uh, it has uh, led to substantive outcomes in areas of mutual interest with a view as the joint statement issued by both presidents say, increasing prosperity, increasing security, and promoting democracy, freedom, and national sovereignty. If you read the joint communique, the joint statement, uh, it ranks support for Venezuelan interim uh, president Juan Guaido and restoration of democracy in that country at the top, followed by security matters, combat terrorism, uh, uh, narco uh, trafficking, uh, and then you have uh, uh, the uh, important, uh, there are question of visas, uh, easing visa requirement for Americans wanting to visit. Brazil. Uh, there are issues regarding uh, uh, giving Brazil something called as a uh, 
designate Brazil as a major non-NATO ally. This is, may sound absolutely superficial. It may uh, entitle, open the way for Brazil to acquire some military equipment in the United States that it would not be able to do otherwise. Also, in certain areas of intelligence agreement in the military area, it's important to be recognized that way. But obviously, there are budgetary issues here. Uh, Brazil is not a washing money, and those this type of gear costs a lot of money. Uh, there is also uh, the associated with this, the Technological Safeguards Agreement. This was tried once when President Cardozo and President Clinton signed an agreement to make a space base we have in northeastern Brazil called Alcântara to make it viable for the launching of communication satellites and uh, meteorological satellites. This died in Brazilian Congress because of opposition of the party that took over in 2003. Uh, again, you know, state visits are opportunities for the bureaucracies of both countries to see what's in the in the drawers there, what people were doing. Let's revive some of that stuff. Uh, important stuff. Uh, there is, for instance. Uh, statements, commitments to reduce barriers for trade. Uh, there is one also that is uh, very, there are some obviously <coughs> trade issues that are specific, that are dealt uh, uh, in this, this communique, this joint, this joint statement. Uh, and uh, the recreation of something called the Brazil uh, U.S. CEO Forum. This is a commission, a committee. Uh, if you don't know, this was done during the time of Lula as president, I believe. And uh, they met, and they met again, and they met a third time, and they kept meeting, and nothing came of it. Now you have a new opportunity. Uh, maybe this time, since there is now more of a convergence in terms of economic ideas between Brazil and the United States, maybe this can be uh, finally productive. Uh, finally, there was something regarding uh, U.S. support or President Trump's signaling support for Brazil's accession to the OECD. Uh, very important from the pers perspective of Brazil, uh, and uh, Brazil uh, countering with an offer to, in own, its own self-interest, uh, uh, forego special and differential treatment in the World Economic, uh, uh, the World uh, Trade Organization negotiations. Again, uh, nothing particularly new in the bilateral relationship. Uh, in 2004, this was offered to Brazil. Uh, the, o, the OECD director general came to Sao Paulo for a meeting and offered accession of Brazil to the OECD in an expedited manner. And Brazil refused it. Uh, because to do this, you have to open up your economy. You have to put your economy to the standards of the OECD countries. Uh, I think this is promising, this is important, <coughs> but you have to understand this uh, in context. And the concession made by Brazil uh, is uh, 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 kind of inevitable. The WTO, uh, in order to prosper, it has to reform itself. It is not reasonable that uh, China and Mali would have the same sorts of protections as developing countries. And this is a very difficult issue uh, that the two countries can tackle, have to, they have to tackle. With that, uh, I would like to, so, and also, as you could imagine, President Bolsonaro invited President Trump to uh, go to Brazil. This obviously will be negotiated. But with that, I would like to offer the floor to
Uh, we didn't plan this in terms of who goes first. Uh, I would ask each of you guys to uh, speak to from about six minutes in the first round and highlight what you think were uh, sort of important. What what we should? What is the, your take out of this trip? And who goes first? If you don't say in two seconds, I will. <coughs> I will pick one. Tiago, yes. You can go first. Oh, sorry. Well, um, I think one of the at the end of the day, the trip brought some results and some concrete results that. Um, Everyone, those that agree with it, this administration, those that disagree with the administration, they can consider that the results were productive and the results were reasonably good. But there are several layers within what this trip actually meant and what is the symbolism behind this trip. First, I think that the symbolism of the approach of two leaders right now, the two major leaders in the region, in the, in the new world, that share similar views of the world, I think this represents, uh, at least symbolically and, and the imagery, something very strong as a message, as a, even a silent message, a pictorial message to the rest of the world. Second, I think that this trip domestically for Trump was not only important, but necessary. Uh, Trump, who is being more and more put against the wall internally by, um, the grand majority of the press, by his own actions, by uh, the Democrats, by his own party. He needed to demonstrate and to show that somehow his ideas and his modus operandi are gaining traction outside of the United States. And that this can represent some sort of legitimation for the actions that he takes domestically that are in many ways deemed as erratic. <coughs> So I think that for him it was important to bring this uh, view that he is not uh, alone in this type of behavior, in this type of narrative, of rhetoric, uh, of perception of the world, and that others from important countries like Brazil are sharing that. Having said that, um, the U.S. also gained a lot from the trip. Just as one example, for example, the, the importation of 750 tons of wheat by Brazil uh, without any tariff being applied is a major victory for the U.S. That represents around 10% of Brazil's importation of wheat. So that was definitely a major victory. The OCDE, which is very important for Brazil for many reasons, um, including the, the way that the investors will look at Brazil from now on and how they, th this brings legitimation to certain Brazilian positions wasn't granted uh, without something heavy. And the, the new profile that Brazil would have to ad adopt at the WTO matches directly a lot of the interests that the U.S. has in their bilateral trade with, uh, with Brazil. But I think also something that wasn't explicitly mentioned, but it was fiercely discussed, and that we have to take it into consideration, is the China factor. Um, this uh, Brazil and uh, this approximation, the symbolic approximation between Brazil and the US, also sends a message to China that they will have to either review part of their approach and their strategy towards Brazil, or their current status will start to drain away like sand in the hand. And this is something that there were several uh, uh, discussions between the two presidents and the technical teams about this issue. Huawei was one of them. Brazil will have a huge 5G uh, bidding uh, into 2020, and the direct or <coughs> indirect participation of the Chinese plays a major role into that as well. So. Those sort of things also, they can reshape some of the behavior that, and I'm not talking of President Bolsonaro, but that the rest of the team of the Brazilian administration, they tend to have a more neutral view towards China. This can, this trip could have perhaps tipped some of this view, at least in technical aspects, to be neutral to negative. 
I'm not talking about the commercial balance. I'm not even talking about the behavior of the agri agribusiness sector who desperately wants to maintain a positive stake in their relationship with China. But in other technical sectors, telecom, banking system, <coughs> infrastructure, the uh, bills that are related to the uh, uh, acquiring productive land in Brazil, uh, ports, the privatization of port terminals, highways, railways, everything that the Chinese has observed over the years. They, this approach and this meeting here could tip the balance slightly negative for the way that technicians in Brazil will look at that from there on. And I think that this was a major victory, a major silent victory for Trump. Thank you very much, Thiago. Who's next? Who goes next? Should I? I'm happy to do it. <laughs> okay. First of all, thanks. Roberto. Thanks, Paulo, for, for having me. Bom filha casa torna. I was a fellow here. It's great to be back. Um, and I, I want to pick up on, on some of the things that uh, Thiago discussed. Uh, and first, I think, you know, pundits and, and the press and um, us in general tend to look at these trips in, a, I would say, a, a check, with a checklist approach, right? We look at OECD, is it good for Brazil, is it good for the United States, WTO, uh, the visa exemption, etc. I think we should start facing it more as a, 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 with a framework approach, right? I think <clears throat> part of the effort we saw today was to build a framework with all these points, uh, all these topics, and uh, and now you know when you look at this as a framework, the question becomes you know what is the trajectory moving forward, right? Um, and how sustainable this this platform uh, this framework is? Um, what are the the potential roadblocks moving forward? Uh, and, and what can be done at the national level, the international level, uh, to keep it going, right? So I think you know if we look at Brazil. Um, you know, I think if the Paulo Guedes agenda does not take off pretty soon, what was discussed here will not deserve a line in future history books, right? OECD membership, CEO forum, or energy forum, etc. I think many people here in the United States, including the private sector, are now looking at Brazil and saying, okay, so you guys should start, you know, really discussing uh, pension reform, and as, as it was discussed here, uh, during the very interesting IMF uh, panel, other reforms to, you know, reach some fiscal consolidation, increase productivity, ease of doing business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and I think the situation for the government, and I assume Maurice will be talking a lot about this, it's, it's, it's pretty challenging at this point. Um, and also, you know, looking, it's interesting how the dynamics between the president and the media in the United States and in Brazil is similar in many ways. But I think after the, 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 the trip, there, it seems to me that emerged a narrative that Brazil made too many concessions with, it, with little gains, right? And the answer to the question we still don't know, right? If we think about a trajectory as a framework and moving forward, this could set the tone for the improvement of bilateral ties. But I think the notion that uh, Brazil gave away too much with gaining too little if the United States fails to, you know, improve uh, trade and, you know, prioritize Brazil, et cetera, in, in, in ways that we haven't seen in a while in the bilateral relationship, I think this frustration could have severe and long uh, or, uh, and enduring impacts, potentially contamin contaminating the, the bilateral relationship moving forward. Then I think there, there has been, a, I would say, a primary mistake from the outset uh, regarding Bolsonaro's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, which was the, the partisan approach to the bilateral relationship, right? I know the, the Brazilian embassy here seeked uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi for a meeting that in the end didn't happen. But look, when you have the son of the president with a hat, Trump to 2020, when you have the president of Brazil at the White House saying that he's, he's confident that Trump will get reelected, this is, you're, you're taking sides, right? And, and, you know, maybe Trump will be reelected and, and Brazil gets lucky or Bolsonaro gets lucky, maybe not. Um, and this is, obviously we're seeing the reaction, you know, uh, Democrats 
uh, like Representative Wilhelm Omar, you know, tweeting against Bolsonaro. I think, you know, if Trump loses an election, you know, maybe President Elizabeth Warren or President Biden will not be able to move forward this very ambitious agenda because it's Bolsonaro and Bolsonaro was closely aligned with Trump. Um, so this, this is, for me, a concern. Uh, and as a parenthesis, we're seeing now in Chile that, you know, <clears throat> several congressmen, including people from Pineda's base, are refusing to meet with Bolsonaro. And Bolsonaro's approach to the, the coup in Chile, etc. I think <coughs> we, we tend to look at these things as pure noise, but they do have concrete policy implications, right? Um, Last but not, not least, I, 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 I second what Thiago mentioned in terms of how China plays a key role here, right? Um, <clears throat> if we, again, go back to the present the IMF presentation now, I think it's diff difficult to think of reforms in Brazil without China ha having a major role in infrastructure investments, uh, privatization, you know, uh, fresh capital, uh, trade, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and by the way, if the United States, you know, if the tension between the Trump administration and China leads to a, a, a trade agreement that increases agricultural, U.S. agricultural exports to the Chinese, this will be to the detriment of you know, Brazilians' interests. Uh, but also, the increased tension between Washington and Beijing could contaminate um, the 5G auction. Uh, and in a way corner Brazil and, and, and uh, into a, a position that it would be, would be very uncomfortable uh, in dealing with China. Um, I'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Roberto. I will ask uh, uh, Nick, Nicholas Zimmerman, to present uh, his position on this. Nick is the only American of this group, and he is not any American. He, was the, <laughs> he worked at the White House in the National Security Council staff of President Barack Obama and uh, led the, you know, the logistics organization preparation for, I think, the previous working visit here that happened in 2015 when President Dilma Rousseff visited Washington. So, Nick, why, why don't we offer us your perspective? Sure. Thank you, Paolo. It is, uh, it's a real honor to be here uh, throughout all of those years here in, in D.C. I, I leaned on Paolo for advice like the rest of this town has and as he's done for for so now many you know decades. what went wrong. You know? Right, exactly. <laughs> it's all his fault. Uh, it is, it's just really nice to be able to return the favor and, and come to his, his home. I think the first thing I would just note is the lack of time and preparation for this visit. I do think having sat in that seat, um, it's a lot of pressure. And I think the two staffs did quite a commendable job given the fact that they put this together in essentially 12 weeks, not even. Um, and, and I do think we should keep that in mind as we assess objectively what was accomplished because a lot of this can set a frame for things to come in the future. And again, it was a tight window. Um, at a high level, I think that this visit was more than many of us who follow the relationship could have ever imagined in terms of the geopolitical symbolism. It feels like Brazil has upended, if not the fundamental tenet of its foreign policy approach, one of them, which is a multilateral, not pick any one side, try to play all of the big powers against each other to advance uh, what is properly a Brazilian interest. And this was true throughout the Cold War. It was even true in, in a more unipolar context in the post-Cold War era. And it's largely been the case as we see an ascendant uh, China in the 21st century. And it does feel like, on some level anyway, certainly symbolically, Brazil chose a side in a way that just hadn't been present in its foreign policy uh, in, in modern times. Um, there's another takeaway from, from where I sit. This is a defense relationship and a security relationship that's deepening in sophistication. Um, and that's something that started actually under the previous administration. So when we talk about technology transfer, um, Alcantara, uh, increased information sharing about trafficking, a lot of this was put into place by defense agreements that have been actually worked on for most of the 21st century, whether you're looking at a Tucano government, a PT government, or now a Bolsonaro government, one of the big uh, 
deliverables from the visit that I participated in was the signing of a JSOMIA, which is a military information agreement. It's how the United States practically, legally can share classified information. We hadn't had that in place with Brazil before 2015. You can forget Alcantara. You can forget the big FX2 deal. If that agreement had never put into place, none of that is, is even possible. So there's some continuity particularly in the defense space, we see an infrastructure being put into place for a level of cooperation that, that hasn't existed previously. But besides that, I find the substance, so symbolism more than I could have ever imagined, the substance, I think it's much more up in the air. It's, it's, it's a, a bit what, you know, Roberto talked about. I also just think this concessions frame, it's the wrong way to think about the visit from both sides. It's not about who gave more or less, it's about what is being done structurally, institutionally, between these two countries in advancing their mutual interest and in a vacuum, each one advancing their interest if they can't do so in a mutual uh, fashion. That, that's it. So you could say Brazil compromised on a spirit, a principle of reciprocity with the visas, but its tourism sector is gonna benefit from, from this move. You, I don't think thinking about it in terms of pure political concession makes sense. Can Bolsonaro use that added revenue, <coughs> more tourists coming from these four countries, to bolster his political project back home? I don't know, but I think that's the way that we should be looking at all of these, um, all of these questions. And with the OECD, I think that this is a win-win, but substantively it, it, it could be a big deal, it, it could not be. We'll see if Paulo Gedges and company can actually implement the reforms that are necessary to make the accession stick. And if they don't, I think you know the OECD has not really been a focus of US trade policy under the last couple of administrations. They'll happily let this thing die. I don't think anyone in the office of the US trade representative is really gonna care if it goes nowhere, to be honest. Um, and they're trying to take care of their own priorities with getting some concessions back from, from the WTO. So uh, again, I think it's a big, it's a big, it's a big question mark. Um, so to sum up, I think a lot was accomplished in a relatively short period of time, and both sides should be commended for that. I think there is a framework that has been implemented that could lead to more meaningful and deeper cooperation. Um, I don't think we're there yet, and I'm not at all convinced that we will get there. And then one of the last point, um, which is the legacy point, which is that this visit in many ways was shocking from an optics perspective. In my view, Jair Bolsonaro came to Washington, D.C. Uh, his advisors and family have come to Washington, D.C. previously, and they have de facto Netanyahuized Brazilian policy in Washington. Uh, it is overtly partisan now. Um, that does not serve anyone's long-term interest if you're someone who's interested in a strategic partnership over a long term. And we should not underestimate that, irrespective of what happens in 2020. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to hear from Mauricio Moura. He's a poster, an excellent analyst. And uh, Mauricio, I'm curious about uh, how you think the visit uh, is being viewed back home in Brazil. Well, good afternoon, Paulo. Thanks for the invitation. And my, uh, yesterday, I became concerned because I'm going to have competition to analyze the U.S. election. Bolsonaro said that Trump, we're going to win for sure. <laughs> so it's the first time that I saw a, a head of state talking about elections. Uh, I'm going to go one step backwards. Just uh, since I start polling in Brazil, foreign policy is not a, one of the big issues in the Brazilian public opinion. But when we do polling, uh, Brazil-U.S. relation, there's one topic that everybody would love to see, is the exemption of, uh, of visas for Brazilians in the U.S. Uh, last time I, we polled, uh, before the trip Bolsonaro came, like two weeks ago, 82% of Brazilians would say that the real gain in foreign policy would be to the U.S. exempt the, the tourist visa for Brazilians. And actually, 76% uh, agree that Bolsonaro should exempt the, the tourist visas for the Americans. So this is something that the population agrees. And what's funny that last, the last two days, millions of Brazilians went to Google search. I don't know if you guys follow the Google trend, uh, searching that if the U.S. is going to do the same for Brazil. So people were uh, actually in Brazil, millions of Brazilians were searching, the, do I need visa to the U.S. after? Because they thought that was something that would be uh, uh, some kind of reciprocity. So when the public opinion finds out in Brazil that it's the only way, street, uh, this is not going to play well for, for Bolsonaro. Uh, 
another thing that we, we pull, and this is a very uh, specific, we run some service with the Brazilians that live in the US and they were, they were very supportive for Bolsonaro in the, the results and the election here show this. And uh, they also, 82% 80, also agrees that accepting a visa for Americans is a good thing. 97% uh, don't agree with the, state did, uh, with the statement did by the congressman uh, Eduardo Bolsonaro that uh, the, the illegal immigrants in, in, in America, Brazilian illegal Im immigrants in America are kind of a shame. Uh, so they don't agree with that. And, uh, but one step backwards, how is Bolsonaro playing in Brazil right now? Uh, this week we did a survey, and when we ask about the evaluation of the president itself, 34% uh, answered very, very good and good. So compared to the first term of Cardoso, Cardoso was uh, polling 41% at this time, Lula in his first term was polling 51%, and Dilma in, his, in her first term was polling 56%. And what struck us is that Bolsonaro was polling in January, in the beginning of the, the, when he took office, at a level of 49. So he came from 49 to 34 in two months. And basically, it was uh, the people that is, are not evaluate him very good or good, that was in January, are basically low-income people that live in big cities in Brazil. And he still have a, a very strong support in the, uh, the, the high segment of, of income of Brazilians is still... Uh, basically, the 35% the is basically people that have higher income, essentially male uh, from the south, southeast of Brazil. So he's, he has, uh, he's basically speaking to the, his core voters. And uh, then the level of confidence of the government lost 10 points in, in two months. So he's going to have to play a lot with the local agenda in those coming months if he wants to move the, the, the government agenda forward. But this trip was about the visa, and people think that the U.S. is going to do the same that Bolsonaro did. Well, uh, I would like to offer the four friends here a chance to, a couple of minutes to comment on each other's presentation. Tiago would go first, or? No, um, yeah, no, first of all, I agree with all the points. I think that we do have to look at um, this visit as a framework, not as a checklist. Um, again, we, we had several levels in which there were different groups showing different interests within the same visit. So you had investors and businessmen looking at uh, the pension reform. You had the uh, defense personnel looking at uh, other sorts of agreements. So overall, I also agree that they, there are pretty ambitious uh, tasks on the table that lasts longer to be accomplished than the time given to each president in their first, in their first <coughs> term. Uh, I also agree with the point brought by Nicholas that it could definitely be a problem for how this administration is going to, to handle if uh, Trump is not reelected. The relationship uh, has to be with the United States, between the United States and Brazil. Obviously, a positive relationship between two presidents only enhanced that. We can remember how Clinton and Cardozo got along very well. Um, but at the same time, we cannot depend only on that um, because it, it really backfires. And uh, when you get to such high-level relationships, uh, business is very separated from the personal relationship. But overall, I agree with my colleagues on the table. I think everyone brought in very uh, strong and valid points. Keeping the, the same order. Sure. I think we... Go back. Yeah. I think we're generally in agreement. And we failed to, to you know, discuss one important point, which is Venezuela, I think. And it, it is a really... I'm free to discuss it. I will. <laughs> I think it's a particularly important point for Trump uh, in view of the two, two 2020 elections, uh, but also it's a crucial import, uh, point for Brazil. Uh, we had a scene uh, at the White House where um, Bolsonaro was asked about a military intervention uh, in Venezuela, and he kind of deflected the question but saying that he would not, just like Trump did not expose his strategy against ISIS, he would not expose his strategy against Venezuela. I think many people in Brazil interpret that as, oh my God, he's kind of giving carte blanche to the United States to, be, to more overtly threaten Venezuela militarily. Uh, 
Um, other folks were saying, look, he was just trying to be nice to, to, to Trump and not to, you know, say that Brazil would never support um, <clears throat> uh, military action against Venezuela. But the truth is, I think, and I'm curious to, to, to hear what uh, Mauricio has in terms of like numbers and public perception, but clearly, uh, look, a big part, particularly the militaries, are very concerned about about Venezuela, and they we saw that when things got really bad with the humanitarian aid coming through the border, the more radical and true believers within the government were pushed aside, and actually it was you know Mourão and other generals who were kind of in charge of uh, <coughs> dealing with the situation and had the mission, including to establish direct channels with the, with Maduro's militaries, right, and. I, I, I haven't seen a good study yet about kind of the spread of immigrants or of re Venezuelan refugees uh, comparing different countries, right? Because in Brazil, we do have a, a pretty big number of Venezuelans, but they are mostly in the northern border of Brazil. They're not in Rio, they're not in Sao Paulo, they're not in Brazil. I think for, you know, the centers of power, the, the Venezuela crisis is still pretty far away. Whereas if you go to Bogota, you see Venezuelans everywhere. Even if you go to Argentina or to Buenos Aires, you see more Venezuelans in Buenos Aires than in Sao Paulo or Rio. Um, so I, I'm not sure, if, in terms of public perception, now I'm putting you on the spot, Mauricio. <laughs> is it, do we have something on... Uh, how oh, I think Venezuela is a big issue for Roraima, and it was a big issue in the state elections of the state in the north, but it's still so far away from the daily issues that Brazilians relate to. Uh, we did polling in Venezuela, and uh, we did a, a survey last month in Venezuela, and mo more than 80% of the people are against a uh, U.S. intervention, even people that support Guaido as a president, because it's still uh, people support Guaido, but see um, the majority see Maduro as the president. So, so 52% see Maduro as the president, but uh, it's a very, it's a very distant issue for the Brazilians. But let me interject something here that is. Well, if you're not following this, you should not. You would not know uh, the position in Brazil. It, I think, it's pretty official at this point. Uh, the president actually left things a little bit vague at the White House, but it's not vague at all in Brazil. Okay, uh, this position has been expressed in public by the vice president of Brazil with the support of, I would say. Uh, lots of his colleagues, that we have eight former generals that serve in the cabinet of President Bolsonaro. Uh, and no, it, it's not that all options are on the table. There is one option that is not on the table, which is a military intervention in Venezuela with Brazilian participation. Uh, the Vice President, Hamilton Mourão, has said that would only complicate things would, and the objective here is uh, to help the Venezuelans get out of this crisis in a peaceful way. Uh, by the way, General Mourão, our vice president now, was a military attaché in Caracas. So uh, I don't think that this will change very much, uh, but you have, uh, you know, uh, problems. Uh, you have issues that someone could try to use. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Guyana, who is into the east of Venezuela, uh, is a country, Venezuelans claim that two-thirds of that country belongs to Venezuela. There is a historic border issue. It's, there is one thing that Brazil does not like, is having uh, border issues near us. Brazil has had settled borders for more than 100 years. The military in Brazil are keenly aware of it. And uh, so this is, if this issue gets out of control, meaning if there is a series of events, a new dynamic that would put pressure on uh, the notion of, uh, of a military intervention, I think that's where you can have a tension between the two countries. In Brazil, by the way, there are a group of people very close to President Bolsonaro, They're led by a gentleman who is uh, described as a philosopher, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Olavo de Carvalho, who accompanied, was in participating in some of the, of the events, who 
publicly attacked, criticized Vice President uh, Mourão uh, in, a, in an event that he participated at the Trump Hotel just next door. And uh, actually, Steve Bannon, very close to Mr. Carvalho, uh, did the exact same thing. Uh, I uh, guarantee you that that did not, uh, it was not very well received uh, among the, by the Brazilian military, and I would say by Brazilians in general. The position that those military <coughs> leaders now in government uh, present regarding Venezuela, I believe, and uh, Maurice, tell me if I'm wrong, I think it's widely shared in Brazil by, so in society. Brazil doesn't see a uh, military solution in Venezuela as a solution at all. So, And uh, Paulo, just, just, uh, just to add a little point here, I think there's a general belief inside the Brazilian administration and, Bra and opinion makers near the administration that this is an option that not even the U.S. will pursue. Uh, this is an option that, claiming that it's on the table, it's, it still means that it's very far away from reality. Second, there are definitions for military intervention, and airlift to drop uh, food or support can be considered a military intervention if you use military aircraft to do such airlift. Uh, and third, forecasting this, the Venezuelan administration anticipated certain uh, aspects very well. First, there are at least 2,000 Russian soldiers inside Venezuelan territory. I don't see right now, as we didn't see in Syria, a situation of US soldiers and Russian soldiers within the same territory. I don't see this happening. Uh, so, and, and third, for you to have an intervention in an environment that still over 70% of the armed forces, at least, are loyal to a specific side, it doesn't make sense. You have to expect at least a, a breakdown in this uh, solidity in order to think this as a real last uh, uh, attempt for anything. Yeah, I would just add that from a, from a U.S. perspective, uh, I, I take Roberto's point, and it was quite an omission. The reason why I omitted it is because for the purposes of this visit and where we are uh, with the situation in Venezuela, um, there's just not that much there right now. So I, I think it was as recent as last week. It, it's not that it seems like the United States' position isn't to consider US military intervention. If I'm not mistaken, Elliot Abrams was prank called by Russians last week where he thinks he's speaking to you know the Swiss ambassador to the UN and he right. says it, or the president, excuse me, I don't have all the details. He says explicitly, we're just using this as a rhetorical device, uh, as a scare tactic. I, it's very transparent, the bolt in 5,000 troops thing to Colombia. I mean, all he all but, gave his yellow pad, right, to the journalist to write about it. This is a calculated ploy. That doesn't mean down the road, if this policy and the larger play goes wrong, that we couldn't see something. But right now, the US has basically indicated itself that that's not what's on the table. And so Trump gets a win. He's got the biggest leader of the Americas um, with, and one that borders Venezuela with him in the Rose Garden. You know, they're there together on it. Bolsonaro doesn't have to go all the way with military intervention. I think he kind of made a little bit of a mistake there. He could have even gone a touch further. My sense is the Trump administration gets that that's their red line right now. And since Washington itself isn't actually planning um, any sort of, of operation in, in the short term, that that's fine. Um, but he gets to be seen as an ally, um, you know, with the big with, with the with the big leader of the multilateral Effort. So in terms of actual substantive discussion and progress for the purposes of that meeting, I thought there was more movement just on other aspects of the agenda, but it's a huge piece of the relationship. It's probably misguidedly in my view, but the number one priority of this White House vis-a-vis -vis Brazil, I think they should be thinking more about structurally about the relationship, but Venezuela is, is the top ticket item. It's just in a healthy status quo, I think, for both sides. Um, right now, and just if I may, um, just to comment on some of the on the other pieces from from the panelists, um, uh, the visa polling stats do not surprise me. There was a lot of pressure to start that type of a conversation when we were prepping the 2015 visit from the Brazilian side. It's why we bent over backwards to try to get some discussions going on the global entry program and get that into the 2015 joint statement. I think it made a comeback. 
we'll see what happens. Um, so that makes good good sense to me. Chiago's point on on China actually answered one of the doubts that I've been having. So I, I did just want to comment on it. One of my first takeaways, as I mentioned here, was that this seems to be a more fundamental re-anchoring or reorientation of Brazilian po foreign policy in a, in a U.S. direction. And yet, uh, Paulo Guedes was giving interviews but before the visit. You know, why? I don't, the Americans, you know, the, you know, like, why can't we dance with whoever we want to about, about China? And then I thought that Bolsonaro's comments about China were actually um, demure. He was discreet. He didn't go after them in, in the Rose Garden. And in fact, very smartly, in my view, mentioned in conjunction with this visit that he'll be visiting China, you know, later in the year. So there was a hedge. And that also led me to believe, well, even on this geopolitical, symbolic, evolution that I think I'm seeing, maybe that's smoke and mirrors too, and, and you know, China will stay a status quo. And so your point about this having been more of a reorientation as Brazil thinks about where to seek alliances in emerging sectors, it makes a lot of sense to me, and just for what it's worth to the group, I, I found that to be uh, an important point and one I had not thought about enough. Thanks. Well, uh, with that, I would like to open <coughs> for questions. Please identify yourselves, make uh, uh, short, incisive, and questions that are, uh, we, I like the ones that are difficult to answer. So I would like to ask João Augusto de Castro Neves from Exxon and a dear friend to ask the first question. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, this is a great panel. I think I have difficult questions. Uh, I don't know if there's an answer, but I think if you take a step back and f being an observer of U.S.-Brazil relations for quite some time, you've seen, and you mentioned this, Paulo, there's been kind of a sense of benign neglect. Uh, and now, from many analysts that we hear, this is a window of opportunity to kind of elevate the, the relationship to, to the next level. Uh, and, and I think this question, I mean, anyone here, the four of them are, you know, can can respond is uh, on the Brazil side. You know, we know that this is this agenda. It has support the Gadget's agenda of opening up and, and bringing Brazil to the, cl closer to the U.S. and to the mainstream or Western world or whatever you, you call it. Uh, this agenda has the support of some folks in the Brazilian government and society, but not all. How strong is, is that? Uh, and I think that also. Uh, 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 Mauricio may, may, may answer to that as well in terms of polling numbers. How strong is this agenda uh, of opening up? And on the OS side, I think, you know, there's been complaints in the past that, you know, they never knew where Brazil stood on many of the issues. And I don't know what's the U.S. perception if they s realize that the U.S. themselves, you know, an endorsement to the OECD or does, uh, does uh, tilt the balance of those forces in Brazil that would like Brazil to open up to the world more. So that's kind of my... Simple question. <laughs> Who goes first? I think there was a question there for Mauricio, for Tiago, about for the four. Um, just, so I'm just going to launch the, launch the first point here for them to compliment. Um, Brazilians, as you know well, um, and the previous administrations and the key decision makers, the key opinion makers, the intelligentsia, whatever in Brazil, always loved to sustain a narrative, a rhetoric of openness and being modern and wanting to diminish the size of the state and each one take care of themselves. Uh, but in actions, this never matches. Uh, the Brazilian actions, they usually indicate the opposite. In, in the previous panel, we saw uh, the concentration of our state-owned banks. Uh, we've seen how the, the, the government basically uh, the structure of the government kidnaps our capability of improving infrastructure by not investing themselves and by blocking our capability to do privately through the bureaucratic hassle that it's created constantly by the system. So openness is something that we like to talk. It's like a friend of mine says, it's like heaven. Everyone wants to go there, but not now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's the idea of openness in Brazil. <laughs> 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 everyone likes to talk about openness, everyone, but the implementation, the execution, and for you to open, you have to clean, and for you to clean, you have to throw some things out. And that's, I think, the key question in administration that only that became an accumulator and not someone that cleans up. 
Uh, from my experience, polling, uh, this is, uh, if you will, if, if people sell well to the public opinion, especially because we had this with the car industry, with the, the, with the computer industry, so if people see the, the advantage in a daily basis for the regular folk in Brazil, that's a goal. That's, that's a, have a huge support. But actually, that doesn't, we don't see campaigns, people saying how, what are the good things about opening the economy in, in a daily basis. So just a, a historical comment here. I think one could summarize the, the bilateral relationship as a series of missed opportunities, right? It was Dilma and Obama, then you had Snowden, it was Obama and Lula, then you had Iran and Honduras and what have you. It was Clinton and, and, and Fernando Henrique, then you had Plan Colombia, et cetera, et cetera. And as a, someone who studies a lot of the, the 1970s, when Medici came to Washington to visit Nixon. Nixon was in love with him, wanted to do you know, all sorts of big projects to fight communism in the region. And then you know, four years later, a guy who came into power and you know, shifted Brazil to a different direction. Will this time be different? And it's interesting, if you, th if you think on a more historical perspective, you know, usually after these periods of great love, with the exception maybe of World War II, because it was very different, Brazil was fighting with the Allies, uh, usually the spirits last for like two years, five years max, um, and then boom, something, usually something external or, you know, changing preferences within Brazil, kind of switch the balance back to, to kind of, back to the norm, I would say. Maybe, so that's going back to Nick's point, uh, I think <clears throat> it will be interesting to see what really moves the needle here, and if we're seeing actually structural changes such as, you know, you pass, uh, you pass a, a, a treaty that allows for increase in, in, sh in uh, sharing of intelligence, then you do Alcantara and what's next, et cetera. If you build up on things, then you can see a, a structural change. But I think history is not on Bolsonaro's side <laughs> at this moment. Uh, just, just make a point important that uh, good relations with West, U.S. presidents don't translate into votes in Brazil. <laughs> Uh, remember, Dilma, Obama was well, had a good evaluation among the Brazilian voters, but Dilma played well when she didn't came because of Snowden. So that was a Brazilian opinion, something the right thing to do. Yeah, my sense on that last point would be the relationship really matters in a Brazilian domestic context, just on the basis of the results that it delivers on, on, on the ground more than anything else. So it's a great question. It's the question I think at the end of the day that's most on my mind just generally as I take in these last several crazy uh, days. Um, and Roberto's point about history is, is fascinating. Um, and I should, I should go back and do a little bit more history reading, but um, it's, been, it's been a while. My sense, my gut, is it's not a conviction at all, and we'll have to see how things play out, but my sense is that my fear is, despite this incredible ideological and aesthetic alignment between these two leaders, this will be another missed opportunity. The geopolitical symbolism and reorientation is a really big deal, but a lot of it is happening on the basis of the personalities of these two leaders or their most inner political circles. Um, there are real institutions that at play. We're talking about two of the largest democracies in the world, forget the region, huge staffs. Um, it takes a lot of hard work. There are a lot of incongruencies between the two countries economically. You take a moment like this to start that really hard structural work and change so that it endures when there isn't this type of char charismatic leadership-based relationship. Bolsonaro hasn't been in office as long as Donald Trump, but I can safely say that implementation is not the Trump administration's strong suit here. Um, I suspect that we're going to see something similar in Brazil, but you know, I obviously, I obviously don't know. And so there will be some very real advances as all of these visits. Each visit gets something done and accomplished, and it's another kind of feather in the cap. I think the defense piece, Roberto, you like laid it out quite well. You get one win in 2015, it makes another one possible, and suddenly you look up. It's 2030, and maybe you're in a different place. To me, maybe that gets replicated in a couple of different sectors. That would realistically. That's the best that this period of time in Brazil-U.S. relations can do uh, from the point of, if, if your objective is to create a truly strategic partnership that's comprehensive, that to me seems like the best case scenario. I'm not even sure we'll get, we'll get there. I do have a sense that somehow, yet again, it's gonna end up being two ships passing each other in the night 
um, you know, and not really, not really getting there. Um, I take no joy or personal, you know, pleasure from that, from being on, on the other team. It, it just, it is my sense. It's not getting stickier because of this visit in, in practice. Okay, Nick, thank you. Gustavo Fonseca from the World Bank. Well, thank you. Very interesting panel. Uh, I would like to talk, touch on a, a topic that wasn't discussed here. Uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion prior to the visit in the Brazilian press and also in, in public uh, uh, relations circles about uh, the environmental agenda uh, or changes in the environmental agenda that uh, would be brought to that meeting uh, with President Trump. Uh, and the expectation was that the administration would be very uh, uh, friendly to uh, uh, President Bolsonaro's uh, <coughs> push to deregulate, uh, particularly on the commodity production side, uh, the question of uh, reducing deforestation from supply chains. Uh, there was a, a push to uh, make flexible uh, mining on indigenous lands and uh, a series of related topics that eventually apparently were not uh, touched upon or were not reported. And I wonder why was that the case, uh, given that there was a lot of expectation that this would be a, a big part of the uh, agenda for uh, the discussion. Yeah, and I would like to add just an information it's in the joint communique that the two leaders welcome the creation of a 100 million biodiversity impact investment fund that will catalyze <laughs> sustainable investment in the Amazon region. Please. Is that what you say? Yes, and do, do you know what they're talking about here? And do you have, uh, could you enlighten uh, us? I, I, I'm not gonna be able to enlighten you very much, no. Uh, I'll just say, I, I was not aware of all of that back and forth previously. I don't know if my Brazilian colleagues have insight into that on the Brazilian side. I will just note, it's, it's ironic that, um, I, I purposefully didn't touch on these issues because again, as one of the architects of the 2015 visit, the key deliverable there was Brazil and the United States leading together on the foremost, in my view anyway, global challenge of the day, climate change. They both had a good story to tell and were key to the run up to the Paris negotiations. The view at that time in the Obama administration was that this was a perfect example of how you start to create a different type of strategic relationship, how you work with Brazil again with a pretty good story to tell on environmental activism, fourth largest democracy, one of the bigger you know, emitters out there. Let's work together on this thing. That's a blueprint for a truly 21st century strategic partnership. It got its own joint statement um, and then was included in the bigger joint statement. Our joint statements were a little bit longer than the Trump ones. But nevertheless, uh, to see where we are today, I think, is indicative of the stakes that are involved in political elections and how political elections really influence foreign policy and bilateral relations. We're in a totally different place, this funding stream uh, notwithstanding, but I'm afraid I don't know how the advocacy behind the scenes broke down. Mauricio, do you have uh, anything to say? Does, how does climate change oppose and does it? Uh, oh, actually there is, um, in, in in the region, specifically in the states like the Amazon and uh, Pará, they are very much concerned about uh, Bolsonaro policies. Actually, during the election, he lost in the, especially the cities close to the rainforest. But this is a very located issue for 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 Brazilians. Okay. Any, uh, anyone else in I, terms of I think Gustavo's that, question? I think that every meeting of any democratic world leader in the world with the Brazilian president, the staffs will always include something regarding the environment, the rainfall. I think it's just a given in, in the conversation with Brazil. But for it to go one step further, you have to have the personal interest of the two sides. So it will always be there. It will always be in the agendas. It will be always be in the preparations. But this extra mile, this extra effort depends on the personal profile of the two. Question, please. Uh, wait, first here, and then we go to JP. Uh, up, uh, yeah, here, where Lara is pointing. Hi, thank you for being here today. Isabel Hoagland with Inside US Trade. Um, two questions. Uh, one, do you think Trump's um, support for Brazil's OECD membership will put them at odds with Argentina's concurrent accession process? And two, in return for US OECD support, 
Bolsonaro said Brazil would forego seeking differential, special and differential treatment in WTO negotiations. Was this a good trade-off for Brazil? Um, this was mentioned, but I'd like to tease that out a bit more. So on Argentina, um, it seems to me that, you know, one thing is to promise that you're going to support a country's extension to, to the OECD. The other thing is to really advocate for them. And we've seen, you know, a good rapport between uh, Macri and, and uh, Trump from the outset, if I'm not mistaken. I think Macri was the second president to be at the White House, he was the president of Peru, uh, mm -hmm. first was then impeached, and Macri. I think Argentina will go through a, a difficult election period right now. It's facing a huge economic situation, and this inevitably weakens their argument for OECD membership. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, Peru is also on the, uh, waiting in the list. Mexico is an OECD uh, uh, member. The, the point being, you know, and I'll, I'll go back to what I was saying, I think the OECD campaign in Brazil makes sense if the Paulo Guedes agenda takes off, right? If not, I think it's going to be an empty promise. And it goes back, will it be part, will it be like a promise in a written statement or will it be part or will it be a step in a big ladder, you know, putting or taking Brazil to a, a, a different uh, place? So I, that's, that's the question to me. And also regarding also Argentina, I think historically presidents, this was the case with Fernando Cardoso, the two Workers' Party presidents. The first trip they make is for is to Argentina, to Buenos Aires, right? And it's a way to sig to signal that you know Brazil really emphasizes and prioritizes its, um, South America. This is our region, etc. The first trip, first um, Bolsonaro went to Davos, but then he came here to the United States to signal, you know, where where he wanted to align Brazil, and now he's going to Chile. Uh, because he, he has a personal relationship with President Pineda, but he's not going to Argentina. Macri was in, in Brasilia uh, not long ago. Um, why? I'm not sure I know the answer, right? Uh, given that the future of Brazil trade policy depends on Mercosur. Uh, but we haven't seen much uh, in terms of like how Brazil wants to position itself vis-a-vis -vis Argentina, which is a huge, huge question for Brazilian foreign policy. I think it's a foreign policy without political bias. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Question, uh, John Paul, there. Hi, um, Paul Johnson. Um, I think I agree with, uh, with much of the uh, analysis about the visit. I think that um, my question is around uh, optics of the visit and, and victory, well, victories in terms of optics and then the practicality of the working level. Um, I think it was a great uh, summary of some of the past actions of the executive to executive um, affability that has taken place um, over the decades. But to me, from being a Brazil observer for a few years, it seems to not have translated at the congressional to Congress level where actual binding um, treaties um, can take into effect. And uh, also, perhaps through the working level, um, at the working level of U.S. government. I know that um, in some agencies in the U.S. government, there's a lot of scars in terms of uh, fits and starts of, of, of things happening. So. I guess my question is, um, with respect to the U.S. Congress, um, you had mentioned about two ships passing in the night, and um, there's an opportunity for a framework if if the reform agenda in, in Brazil gets passed. But is there a risk because of the partisan um, signals of this visit, with the Fox interview and with you know with with, with the reelection hat? Um, is there a risk of the U.S. Congress being more active in sort of uh, putting a bigger spotlight on Brazil on some civil society issues um, that could be harmful to the relationship? Nick. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a word, yes. <laughs> uh, I think it's a concern. Um, 
as someone who's a member of the Democratic Party, um, who used to work on, on hemispheric policy in the executive branch, I was uncomfortable um, with a lot that transpired in terms of the assertion into a, a US presidential campaign. Um, and I know that I'm not the only one. Now, a lot of what's being pursued in the relationship is in the U.S. interest. Uh, if Brazil does implement, implement macroeconomic reforms and, and is, uh, has the conditions to, in fact, join the OECD, um, that's a good thing for the United States. And I would expect a large portion of the Democratic caucus to recognize it as such. But on the margins, you know, we've talked about the, someone mentioned the, the Omar tweet. Um, I believe Representative Engel has put out a statement in the past on, on human rights and the need for, for respect. I do think there is room for more oversight from the Democratic Party based on what the Brazilian administration does, A, um, and B, how the relationship evolves because, you know, we saw from our IMF colleagues, we're talking about one of the most closed economies in the world. And the United States doesn't really have a tremendous amount of leverage, right? We're not super connected. And so that oversight agenda, it will be tricky for Congress to do much, but I think there's a growing inclination that, that we have to look for opportunities to say something, that we need to signal to the region that this type of political activity here, um, it's not a good thing. Uh, on the WTO question, I just I don't have the numbers, but uh, my sense is that this is a this is a smart hedge from from the United States. If Gedish moves forward with his reforms, that will help U.S. investment um, in, in the region. <coughs> just, uh, in Brazil, it will help Brazil just in and of itself. Um, if it doesn't, they won't become a member of the OECD. It takes a long time anyway. Um, and in the interim, they've got this other p broader policy, which is not Brazil specific, about WTO. Uh, categorizations of kind of they're taking a crack at getting that policy implemented vis-a-vis -vis Brazil. It seems like a win-win, frankly, from, but I don't know the, I just don't know the numbers and how much of a concession it really was. I think even if the numbers don't add up from Bolsonaro's perspective, the politics are pretty good because it signals to the market that he's serious about trying to make these reforms, that he's going to give Gedeish some of the running room to try to get them done. And that just gives him more breathing space. We, we know that Brazil has a very urgent fiscal situation. That breathing space is going to help him politically just to get running as president. Yeah, and also I think that the risk is the follow-up. The loops throughout history that Roberto explained very well since the 70s that demonstrates the, the, the brief moments of uh, approximation and then how it dilutes over time is due to lack of fo following up. And this is either by the, the high level of uh, dedication that the, the administration needs to its domestic issues. And the risk of this happening again, if the follow-up is not continuous and professional, is very high. Because we're going to have the entire country drowned in the attempt to approve the pension reform before the end of the year. So from now until the end of the year, as soon as everyone lands in Brasilia, Brasilia becomes a priority number one, two, three, four, and five. So if we rely on the U.S. to put forward the, uh, the, the intention, the effort, the, the liaison with the European partners for Brazil to become an OECD country, it's not going to happen. Brazil has to take this issue themselves, push it forward, but this will compete with the continuous fires that keep burning under the minister's chairs every day in every ministry in Brazil. So I think that this is probably the biggest risk that we have ahead. Okay, uh, here, question here, and then. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Barry Ames. I'm a political scientist and Brazilianist. Now, at the earlier panel, the, we, there was this question of, of linking the funds recommendations and suggestions to what is gonna come out of, the, of this panel and the next few years. And, and so the fund told us the usual set of fund recommendations that Brazil should open its economy in various ways. But also the last slide said, well, you have to have buy-in by all the major stakeholders. Now we know that the one thing there's not going to be in the next four years in Brazil, given this extremely polarized government, is buy-in from all the major stakeholders. And if, if we, things like cutting the minimum wage is hardly going to 
increase buy-in from all the major stakeholders, right? So it, it seems to me the most likely outcome of the next four years is the kind of chaos we have in the United States with Trump. That is, we have two presidents who are similar, who, are, who have increased polarization sharply, and are governing what are now increasingly polarized societies. In my view, and I think in the view of almost all political scientists, there is no serious possibility of a real political reform in Brazil, of a political reform, of, of, inst of institutions like the electoral system, which is in fact what I, my own specialty. Secondly, there is no chance that letting people have guns more easily is going to decrease violence in Brazil, and personal security was one of the major issues in the last election, as I'm sure, I'm sure you know, that people really care about personal security, and there's nothing this government's gonna do it can do, it, unless you increase oppression overwhelmingly, which is also not likely to happen. So my, view, my guess is that this is going to be a very complicated four years, a very difficult four years, and we will not end up with a kind of buy-in that the IMF is talking about that's a prerequisite for the success and implementation in the other order, implementation and success of its reform. So I, I'd like to see the, this distinguished panel comment on that. Can I? No, I had, a, I had a sense of deja vu when I was watching the IMF presentation. It seems like you have the same slide for every country. <laughs> so I, thought, I didn't know it was Brazil was, or Greece or Italy, so, but it was there. Yeah. Uh, one of the, Argentina, but in terms of, you made a very good point about uh, uh, the difference between Trump and Bolsonaro is that Trump at, at least has a clear political base. And Bolsonaro doesn't have today a clear political base. Because most of the, the, the people in the House that were elected from his party were elected with the mandate to, to end corruption and work on, on public security, anti-violence measures. They were not, they were not elected to, to do any kind of pension reform. So he... <coughs> And also, as a similarity, the, the way that Bolsonaro and Trump communicate, they basically talk to their core base. But Trump has, has people on the, on, the, on the House, on the Senate. Bolsonaro doesn't. He ha he's going to have to start communicating with people outside his core base. And he's going to have to build a political coalition in the, in the Congress that he hasn't yet. So it's a uh, uh, very unlikely scenario in many senses because the, the key agenda of Paulo Guedes, and it was clear in the visit here, is the pension reform, is the economic side. But the mandate that most of the people that supported Bolsonaro are not exactly like that. So this is a very qu like a question mark uh, for the future. What's the polling right now on, on pension reform? No, that's uh, interesting because 40% think that they w they're going to prove something. Uh, in, uh, in any any pension reform, and uh, when they ask if people are against or in favor, they they don't answer because they don't know what's what's on the table. But when when they when they frame the question and ask about the the pension will equal privileges or end privileges, this is something that's a, a high support of because they say, oh, they're going to end the political privileges or even the judiciary system. People see the judiciary making a lot of money, so they, so we are waiting for the government to frame in a professional way this pension reform. Okay, uh, last round. And yes, question here. Thank you again. Uh, my name is Amaury, and I'm a, also a Brazilian transplanted to the United States for the past 20 years. I just wanted to understand, you touched upon the, the conversations with Olavo de Carvalho and, uh, and also with Bannon. Can you perhaps elaborate and, in my case, illuminate as to why, what, what was the purpose of having that meeting with Bannon? Is there any additional... Uh, interest that Bolsonaro has in, 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 um, in a, a larger uh, set of meetings or, or, or perhaps um, agreements with other nations beyond the United States or setting some sort of coalition for the new, what they call the new right. Um, anyway, anything you can, you can elaborate on why that, that meeting took place? Thank you. Do you have any idea? Uh, yeah, just one Isn't comment. Isn't this uh, Bolsonaro or people very close to Bolsonaro yeah. uh, talking to the base? So I think, you know, what we're seeing is that foreign policy is one of the areas together with uh, agriculture, I'm sorry, the environment and education where the kind of the true believers uh, 
have either you know, strong control or they're fighting for control. I think in the case of foreign policy, the militaries also want to have a say. Uh, but, you know, if you look at Brazil's um, foreign minister, um, Ernesto Araújo, he's very connected personally to Olavo de Carvalho. Uh, he, he wrote even, you know, when he was, I think he was already in Brazil, but he served here. After he served here, he wrote uh, that Trump was the Hail Mary Pass of Western civilization. And this was one of the reasons that he was chosen as minister in the first place, right? And also his son, who's now the chairman of the House, Foreign Affairs Commission also wants to have a larger role in foreign policy. He was the one sitting in the Oval Office um, with, with his father. Um, so I think basically foreign policy is an instrument for Bolsonaro to mobilize his base and a pretty efficient one, right? But to go back to Mauricio's point, you know, contrary to, to Trump here, Bolsonaro doesn't have a, a, a Republican Party behind him, right? If he wants to pass cru crucial legislation, such as pension reform, in Congress, he would need to go further beyond, uh, uh, you know, and his own PSL, which is already, you know, there's a big question mark, how will they behave vis-a-vis -vis pension reform? But to constitute a base, he would have to be more, I would say, neutral in many ways. So I, I think, you know, for Twitter or for, you know, just playing, playing to his uh, to his base is very useful, but to pass key legislation and to to push forward policy is actually you know noise and, and distracting. Last round. So with that, I don't think we have more questions. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> well, I think we did it, uh, have a good discussions. <coughs> Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you guys very much, uh, Tiago, Mauricio, Roberto, and Nick. I wanted to thank the previous panel also, Anya, and all our team here for this. We are going to be back here probably next time uh, on a uh, review of an important book by one of our global uh, Global Scholars, uh, Dr. Oscar Villena, Dean of the Fundação Getúlio Vargas Law School. We'll be here April probably 8th uh, to review this book about the 30 years of the uh, Brazilian current constitution. With that, I would like to thank you very much and ask you to keep uh, in touch with us via our uh, website and by email tweets or just coming here. Thank you very much and good afternoon.